It's another Spike Studio production. If you have any problems seeing anything on the screens, please let me know. Otherwise, welcome to another Consult in Your Pocket webcast. This one a little bit different. We'll talk about the cloud, cloud technology. This is going to be an upcoming topic everyone's hearing more and more about. So we had this plan for a while, and I wanted to address a couple things in this one. And first, got to give you some news of what's coming up, of course, and what new things are going to be going on. First thing is always uh, another webcast from this. It'll be recorded. It'll be available for you later on. You'll be able to watch it as you want, share it with other people in the organization or anywhere else. And we've expanded some of the things we're doing through Spike Studio, so you'll see a lot more video content coming out the door. Uh, if you haven't been checking out, there's a YouTube channel, uh, YouTube Spike Studio, and also the I Do Notes stuff is up. So a lot more of the screencasts and actual live content for you to get your hands on. And right after Lotusphere, we're having I Do Sphere, uh, February 15th and 16th, two days. So if you're not signed up yet, get signed up. It's only 35 bucks now, but it's two days. Tons of sessions are up there, sessions you're not finding anywhere else. Uh, great speakers you all know. Uh, some new ones as well, covered everything from development next pages through deploying Android and Linux. Uh, the list is up there on the site itself, so you get a good indication of what's up there. Everything will be recorded, so if you can't get to one session, they'll be recorded, and only attendees that register uh, will get to see the recording. So this is not something that will be free later on the web. We're doing a virtual seminar for two days, but it's all going to be live. So everybody you see will be presenting, so they'll be able to do live Q&A with your speakers as well. So. As usual, this one is brought to you pretty much by Connectria. Um, been around the longest in terms of non-IBM hosting. You guys have heard of it before, but it's not a sales for us. You're not going to see anything about us in there. What you're going to get from this one is an architecture learning about over 10 years of doing this in the hosting world. So I'm going to give you things you can go to any provider, be it Lotus, be it us, be it uh, Prominix, be it whoever, and actually ask the right questions about working with the cloud in your environments. That's the whole idea of what we're doing this one for. We are one of the only SAS 70 Type 2 certified that there is, and across all our data centers as well. So you'll get a, a good indication of what's going on in this one. This is going to be a hot topic in Lotusphere this year, the cloud. I did the database, did a search, showed over 30 sessions that either mention or have the word cloud either in the title or in the description. So you can pretty much imagine you're going to hear that everywhere you go coming across. We're going to talk about the variations, hosted, hybrid, on-premises, Every one of them you can possibly manage will be covering. So have no fear. We'll talk about those. If you have questions as we go, as always, please put them in the window. I'll uh, be glad to get to them as we go along. I didn't put any polls in this. I don't know what you're using now. We're going to go with the idea that all of you are investigating and want to ask the right questions when you get into it. That's what this one is totally about. So don't be afraid to type in questions as we go along. Last, think about how this fits in. Your architecture is going to be totally uh, dependent on everything you've built over the past X years with Lotus Domino technology. And some of this will apply across the board for any hosting you want to do. So the idea is to be able to ask the right questions, see how it fits in your current architecture, as well as your plans of what you're going to do. You know, keep in mind, you can pretty much piecemeal any part of Lotus technology outside of your environment into one of these, hybrid, fully hosted, on-premises, and together you can do all the pieces together. So that's the biggest part of the puzzle. This in no way, I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures, represents every possible scenario. But I did one cool thing is I simplified every single one of these as best I could. I wanted you guys to see the simplest diagram without getting into tons of different network stuff that's there. A couple quick definitions. We're not going to get into these, but you'll hear them a lot when you talk about cloud technology, so you should be aware of them. Business continuity is one of the biggest. It's a hot site is what you have, a site that is available if you go down. A lot of places will be selling hybrid or hosting based on business continuity, meaning they don't plan on you using them as their primary data center space or even in a hybrid environment, meaning it's live data. They plan on using them only if you go down. So keep that in mind when you're looking at pricing costs and other things. How is it specified? Is it as a live data or not? And where is it located? Uh, DR falls into the same area as well as fault tolerance. Fault tolerance should be fully built in, ready to go no matter what you're doing with all of these be it a hybrid, be it fully hosted, fault tolerance should be there. And lastly is the redundancy, not just in your Domino instance, but across the hardware, the network, and the backups. We'll talk about that as we break down the different sections. 
So keep that in mind. We're going to talk a lot about the different keywords as we go through and how it fits in. So what I did really quick is took each part of Lotus Live and made one slide out of it, just so you're familiar, and then we go start going through all the topology stuff and how you build it. Uh, I didn't want to go deep into it. It's not a competitive thing at all because I'm just going to show you exactly what they have on the website, but you need to understand there's a lot of variances, and when you start talking about cloud technologies in Lotus, there's a lot of different things you can do. You can expand your current architecture, or you can jump into some of the alternate architectures that they're offering. The first one up, as an example, is Engage. They've got three pricing models. It's all web conferencing. It's not really what you'd see internally of your same time, but it's a web conferencing. So anywhere from $8 or $7 if you're a client now, all the way up through 46 for unlimited meetings. So it bases on attendee count, how many people, things like that, so you'll weigh your needs. Why am I bringing these up falls into when you start looking at outsourcing models and hybrid models, you need to understand the pricing models that go with them when you get into your hosting world as well. Then they jumped over to Connections, which isn't standard Lotus Connections. It's another Connections one. Uh, think of you know the same file sharing, some messaging, some activities. About six bucks a user a month, so you're getting everything you need in a six dollar user month package on their side. So that's the big part of that. The idea being that you don't have to worry about any of the back end infrastructure. But this isn't full connections as you know it, nor is it meeting services. Uh, it's a piece they call connections. Meetings. So picture same time eight five one. The new same time is out there, but it's not same time. You're running across another infrastructure that they have running meetings themselves. It has a bunch of cost variables built into it. And this is where the hybrid modeling and hosting modeling really gets confusing a lot of times to people. It's understanding, well, how do I currently fit in with my current licensing model in Domino? Is this part of it? Can it be expanded? Do I get a discount? How many users? So for this one, you get $5 a user a month if you're an existing Lotus customer, uh, but it's only up to 200 outside attendees. Or you could do unlimited meetings for only up to 15 people inside or outside for 39. If you choose the six or five dollar, you get into you know who's attending the meeting. Is it an internal person or external? There's a whole bunch of things inside of that. So keep that in mind when you guys do pricing. Everything else after we're done with this is going to be strictly architecture. Um, events. It's kind of what we're using here, but I'm using uh, go to webinar only because it was out first. And I already had an agreement with these guys. But same thing, taking meetings to the next level, event rehearsals, emails like you guys get in advance reminding you, summaries, things like that, $79 a user a month for up to 1,000 people. Same type of idea. So you'll get a lot of different opportunities and options. They jumped into iNotes just a while ago, but that wasn't Domino as you know it, and this was a confusing naming scheme. So Lotus Live iNotes is the web interface back from the Outblaze. You know, they have the user storage cap. You can do pop and IMAP support. All that's there with built-in spam and virus. It's great. Three bucks a user a month, you get some account management. So for those of you looking at moving maybe a sales team or just a factory group or something like that, you could give them a good web interface, pretty cheap and inexpensive. Now they've just released Lotus Live Notes. Now we're going to get into your architecture and how it fits together. So Lotus Live Notes came out. It's a form of a hosted Domino servers with true iNotes, meaning it's Domino Web Access. It includes spam and virus for everything you have over there, about five bucks a user a month. It uses your rooms and resources, but you can put mail over on that side, no applications. So that gives you a snapshot. So that's all these pieces that Lotus has out there. You're going to hear a lot about it at Lotusphere this year. But let's talk about the architecture and how to get there, and that's the focus of this one is what we're going to talk about. So get ready to start asking questions. I presume there will be some as we go along. Actually, I hope there will be some as we go along. So hosted Domino. What is hosted Domino? In essence, before I even show you a slide, it's a piece of your infrastructure sitting somewhere else. It could be all of your infrastructure. It could be just a mail server. It could be a replica for clustering. It could be uh, just your same time part of your infrastructure. Anything you can possibly imagine inside of it. I should have just said hosted Lotus on this slide is what I should have said. But the idea being is that you're able to then go in and piecemeal what you need based on either expertise, scalability, uh, presence on the web, so you have extranet type support, and we're going to diagram and talk about all these as we go through. So we sit here and we have three data centers ourselves. This is probably the purest form of any of the hybrid cloud solutions you'll talk about, because in a hosted Lotus environment, you have full control. You get to decide everything from direct access to the server in terms of Lotus or the software or the web controlling the users, the policies, uh, domain configuration, certifications, 
you're pretty much guaranteed that you have the ultimate authority over it, or you can release that control to the service that's providing it. So you have the ability to say, we don't want to manage same time we've never done it before. We'd rather have you guys do it, plus it's an extranet, so please take over that part. But we want to be able to control the users. So you can actually split up and hybrid management of the whole thing. You get a choice about servers. We're going to talk about all these pieces in a minute when we start talking about architecture. So you start getting into, is it a dedicated server? Or is it a VM? Or how is this being piecemealed together? You have those flexibility options as well. Um, one of the things that we're finding when companies are coming to us, they're asking us directly, are, am I sharing parts of my infrastructure with other companies? So we get into the sections when we break down each part you want to ask your provider. We'll talk about those. So that's a big thing with us. So how we're handling hardware allocation to users is a big part of it uh, versus VMs versus splitting up multiple people on the same server, and that's like a Lotus Live notes. So what you'll find with them is they actually have multiple people on the same server, right? You know, they're actually sitting there on the same one. Um, one of the confusing things a lot of people run into with that one is understanding where their data sits and compared to other ones, how it's secured, is it directory, is it on-disk encrypted? There's a lot of questions around that. In the hosted realm, when you talk about pure outsourcing, you guys have full administrative control which is a little bit different. I know with Lotus Live Notes, you have a web interface to do a lot of your work, and then you control policies on your site. On this one, you have full domino administrative control where you're able to go to your provider and say, I want to be able to stop and start tasks when I need to. I want to be able to stop and start services. I want to be able to deploy more signatures for my agent manager. Anything you want to do, you have that administrative control. That's a major variable difference. Also, you have the ability to run applications. So keep that in mind, too, is you guys can do whatever you want to do with a lot of these, and you can make these part of your domain or not. A lot of companies want this to be seamless to the users and to themselves. So that's a big part of it, is making this part of your direct domain, and the servers just transparently talk to each other. It's just a connection record is all it is, no matter where they sit. We're going to talk a lot about backups in just a minute, retentions, backup uh, architectures, design, things like that, and how they flow. And then also the SLA. So I don't go deep into the SLA in the slides because every vendor is going to have different SLAs, but it's one of the things you should question when you go in is understanding explicitly every piece of the SLA, not just do we guarantee X uptime. Is that only my hardware? Is it only to the edge? Is it uh, connected to us? Uh, is it the firewalls? Where does this fit in? So the SLA is very important. A lot of companies overlook that part. We try to remind them and present them of that fact, but a lot of them overlook it. They don't understand that. An SLA on uptime may only affect the hardware. It may not affect the network side. So that's a big difference as well. You know, the monitoring that's there, anywhere you put your server should be monitoring it all the time. So that's going to be pretty much expected nowadays. Now, a cool part is the caps. You'll find that a lot of providers are going to cap you with things like 20 gig of mail, 25 gig of mail, things like that. When you guys move to a purely hosted environment later on where you start investigating cost factors, you can set the caps on your own requirements later on. So you know if I'm going to deploy a terabyte worth of disk, well, I've got that to use, and I can allocate it to my users how I want. So I don't have to worry about everyone getting the same or some people getting more, some people getting less. You decide all that. It's up to you. That's what disk is for. You get to allocate what you want, how you want. Maybe the applications need you know, a couple hundred gig each, but users only need 25 to 30 gig. However you want to do it is totally up to you. And that's one of the things that you get to decide, the amount of processor, amount of memory, the amount of uh, disk that's allocated, how the network is connected, is it you know gigabit switches, all that's up in the air. So that's one of the things you want to be able to ask as you go through. And the costs you're going to eat are always your servers. You may be able to buy licensing, you may not. You may have licensing included, you won't. But the cost you're really going to have is per server. So if you want to put a thousand users on a piece of hardware, you can, if you decide to outsource that way, or you can go with a per user model. Both of those models are available. So I know what all you guys are here for, so let's talk architecture and design. And that's probably the biggest part of the whole thing is the architecture and design. This is a simple, simple diagram for purely hosted Domino. This is what you're going to see. You guys are behind your firewall. You're accessing external mail and application servers. Whoever the provider has as a firewall, off you go to the public Internet, which you'll see as we call the scary place throughout the thing. I want to make these diagrams very simple. We're not going to worry about... We'll talk about network connectivity. We're not going to worry about them in the diagrams, but we'll talk about firewalls and networks and things like that. But the idea of a pure hosted environment when you're talking about moving all your data out, 
is you got to sit behind your own firewalls. So you have to open up the right connectivity. You have to go out. These servers then are protected, and then they're available either to the Internet or not, depending on how you want your infrastructure built. This is a key thing to keep in mind as we start talking about architecture diagrams is where these servers will sit and how I'm going to access them. Because now we need to start breaking into the questions to ask your providers as you go along. Once again, if you guys do have questions, please feel free to ask and put them into the uh, question or chat area, and we'll get to them. Okay? No problem there. Now, wait. One actually came in. Let me see if I can open this up a little bit. I was trying to do both at once, and one snuck in on me. Can we talk about hosted versus your own domino server at a co-location facility? Most definitely. Um, I'll cover that really quick now. So we have a question that said, you know, what's the difference between hosted and at a colo? Give you an example. Connectria. We don't do colos. Uh, colo means you just want rack, power, network, and backup possibly. Sometimes not even backup. And you want the server to sit somewhere else. Um, at a hosted facility, this is where we break it up. We do not take someone else's hardware and bring it in-house normally. There's very, in AS400 we do just to say that because we have tons of AS400s because those are very expensive big ones. But in terms of moving a domino instance, we put it on our hardware. And here's the reason why. Uh, your hardware may be older, may be out of support, it may be harder to get parts, it might be brand new, but it might be um, not an agreement we have. In a hosted facility, we provide hardware that we know that we can off the shelf supply parts to, meaning if we have a hard drive burnout, we can walk right next door into the storage area, grab a brand new hard drive, slap it in your RAID array, and you're off and running again. We've got memory replacements. We've got uh, power replacements. We've got network adapter, everything we have there. We also guarantee then that we have uptime on the hardware itself. In a colo, they're guaranteeing power connectivity. They're guaranteeing network connectivity, and that's about it. They may not even guarantee application uptime, which is one thing in a host that you're going to get as well, is they're going to guarantee because they're going to actually manage and follow that information. So they're going to be able to monitor it and watch it. Like I said in a slide before, is you're actually going to get 24 by 7 monitoring, where a colo may not provide that except for the network connectivity and the power. So that's a big difference between the two. We stay away from colo only due to that fact that we want to be able to manage everything about the environment as well as provide you an SLA that meets hardware as well as network and power and backup and everything else. So it's a redundancy issue for a lot of that. If that doesn't answer your question, uh, please let me know, and I'll be glad to get a little bit more onto that one. And actually, I'm going to move this uh, question panel on my screen a little bit. I'll give me two seconds so I can see it bigger. There we go. So now I can actually see the questions as they come in a little bit better for you guys. So that's the last part of the hosted. So let's talk about the cloud. This is going to be a big part of the puzzle. Um, how do I fit in the cloud? What does the cloud mean to me? All the different architecture questions to ask. And this is where I want you guys to think about exactly how your environment works. And if I walked into a provider today, what question would I ask them about all these different categories and pieces? The idea was I put about 20 or 30 slides total in here. I figured you'd have more questions. So as we go along, feel free. Outgoing bandwidth. This is probably one of the most challenging things that we face when talking to a company that wants to outsource part of their infrastructure that they always fail to look at. They say, great, we want to move all our mail servers out to you. Lotus Live Notes is the same, Lotus Live. And we want you to host all these pieces for us. We're going to move 1,000 users to you. Well, we always ask them, what is your current utilization on your bandwidth now? Is it already saturated? Or what are you doing? They go, oh, no, no, it should be fine. Should be fine and where we actually sit are two totally different things. Most of them rarely pull metering reports on outside activity. They may be aware of what their saturation is, meaning how much they've actually utilized, and excuse the sirens in the background for two seconds, not our data center. I promise it's not us. Uh, we actually, as most of you already know that have been on webcast before, we're three blocks from a main firehouse, so sometimes there's nothing, and other times uh, apparently everyone leaves. A lot of times what we ask them to do is if this is going to be an extension of your existing environment or if you're moving existing users across, we're going to ask you to go ahead and send us some of the reports, platform statistics as well as uh, DDM reports, and then we want to see network reports. A lot of people overlook the fact of what other network traffic is going out of my environment. A lot of companies now are under the assumption that, oh, well, we just have general Internet and we have general traffic for you know SMTP going across and people browsing, doing things but they're being swarmed with people streaming data. 
be it YouTube, be it Pandora, Last.fm, music, videos, Vivo, everywhere you can go, it's the streaming that's really getting them. So they're getting a lot of data traffic they weren't accounting for. So when we go to talk about outgoing bandwidth, that becomes a problem. They're not realizing that they're actually already consuming a lot of their bandwidth in normal day-to-day -day activity and adding a load such as 1,000 users, even 500 users, could really put them over the edge. So we have a lot of talks about expanding bandwidth as well as how you'll funnel traffic, and we'll talk about network connectivity in a few minutes. So look at that. You want to be able to pull that up and watch your own activity as well as find proposed utilization based upon current usage. So you should be able to see X users internally going to this server over 30 days use this much bandwidth. That's how much they're going to use going out. So if they're going to be going to a hosted facility, be it notes with compression or over the web or encrypted traffic or VPN, they're going to have to have a model of growth based upon that because they're going to start going outside your environment. That's something you're not used to. So how do you account for it? You take your current utilization, then you map it against your growth data, and then actually then add that in extra space into your bandwidth costs. Um, a lot of people don't realize that just by moving a server outside, they may balance out their costs because while administratively they're saving time and effort, they're adding bandwidth charges. Not to the hosting provider, but to themselves, just to have the necessary bandwidth going outbound. So that's a key factor to look at, and a lot of companies overlook this fact. Um, if you guys need sample reports or what you should look for, mainly you're not a network admin, you're a domino person, let me know, and I can give you some more direct questions or what you should be looking for, but utilization and saturation is a key thing. Also, let me throw this out there, is throttling. I have a lot of companies that are being throttled on notes traffic because Oracle runs the, you know, the environment or something like that that gets priority access. That could affect you going out to a hosted provider if they're looking for either web traffic that's being throttled or even Nodes 1352 traffic that's being throttled already. It'll be even worse going out to the Internet. So keep that in mind. It's a big part of what you want to look at. Once you get your own internal stuff established, you need to look at the provider's bandwidth. How am I connecting to you? What are you dedicating to me? Do I have a cap? Is there a, is there a monthly cap? Is, it, is there a burstable cap? So we'll talk a little bit about bandwidth. Most of your good providers are not going to hit you with a very tiny cap on the amount of bandwidth they will give to you. Uh, they will have a maximum for the month or a maximum at one time that they'll give you, and then they'll have tiers above that for what they call burstable bandwidth. They should be able to support anything you throw at them at all. Right. You should never be hit with a wall just because you went too much or cut off. So it should be burstable, but it may be tiered, meaning after I reach so much data, they're going to charge me a little bit more per gig that I use or something past that. Um, don't be afraid to have them finally describe exactly what that is. We put that into our actual contracts so you understand exactly what you're getting um, and you understand how much. Now, some of the old Domino providers, humorously, they're not around anymore, used to charge you for every bit that you replicated. So for every time you actually did an SMTP message and replicated a database, they would charge you for that. They would not just give you data for a month or data for a year, however you want to look it up. So a lot of them have this bandwidth cap. Keep that in mind when you go to talk to them. You want to know if it's, and this is how it's an important question, is it metered just for your instance? Is it metered for the server? Is it metered for your collection of servers across the cluster? How is it being managed and how is it being measured? You don't want to have multiple servers clustering and your server traffic alone eats up all your bandwidth each month moving data back and forth. Keep that in mind. You don't want to have servers internally that are being built behind their firewalls as external bandwidth, meaning when they're doing the metering, if it's connecting to another external server that's clustered inside that hosting center, you don't want them counting that for the external bandwidth. The reason being, it's never going to the Internet. It's all on their inside network, so why am I being caught in this inside the cap? These are things a lot of people never think of and never ask the right questions. They get caught later with this. Also, if I'm on a shared server, I'm going to use Lotus Live Notes as an example just because they do it that way. If I'm on a shared Domino server, meaning it's, it's not Domino partitioning as we used to know it, it's one Domino instance that is shared amongst some customers. How are they measuring bandwidth? Because everyone's going through the same network connectivity ports unless they can see where I'm coming from the outside world. Meaning on Domino, how would they know how much I'm using if everyone's using the same? So keep in mind how they measure and how they bill. You also want to see what their current saturation is. Even for the providers, you want to know, I want to see a bandwidth report. Don't be afraid to ask. 
Um, a lot of them gave that to you directly. Now, depending on when we talk about the network, how the network is segmented for you, could make a difference. But the idea is being don't be afraid to ask just for the report itself to know that they're not already oversaturated and they're selling you a dream. They don't have the bandwidth you know, to give to you to actually start rolling this out. Uh, for example, we move customers in. A lot of times, instead of them sending us disks, but you've got to put stuff on external storage and send us your mail files on disk, and that's a mess, we replicate the data. During the day, we'll run maybe one replicator or two and just to have a nice stream going. But at night and weekends, when I know that you have a light user load and we want to start moving data across to either a cluster or a new hosted server, we'll turn on four, five, six replicators. Now, guarantee we can draw more bandwidth from most, uh, most every hosted customer we have than they could give us. So we have that ability to do that. So you want to know what the saturation is currently that they were using so you can make sure we can handle that type of provisioning when you guys get into it. Security is a big thing. Uh, I told you at the beginning, you know, we're a SAS 70 type 2, which means controls and procedures, but it doesn't necessarily mean security. It just means we have controls in place. Um, IBM touts that that says they strive to be, and it says on their slide, strive to be a SAS 70 type 2 certified facility. Uh, you want to know about the physical security of the space which you're in. Now, earlier we got the question about colo versus hosted. So because we don't have any colo, there's no one wandering through our data centers. So we don't have anyone that may be walking through. That means, you know, dealing with racks that have to be constantly locked and everything else. What is the physical security? You know, for example, our main da data center space where I sit at, actually, in one of the floors, we have outside physical building security. So it's key coded. Uh, security guards out front. Then as you get upstairs, there's man traps. There's uh, key codes. Then there's another layer of security as you go to the data center spaces, which the key cards have to be rekeyed to add that in, and they have biometrics on top of that. So what is the access? Who has access? You know, who can get in? What's the physical, physical security? Then once you're inside the data center space, besides cameras and everything else, what's the server rack access? Are all of them open and unlocked? Um, are there people coming through? If it's a colo, there's people walking through. Who has physical access? Are they escorted or not escorted? Like ours, you know, being the SAS 70, everyone's escorted no matter where you go in our data centers. You're never alone. Um, if you're not an employee, you just don't walk anywhere alone, and you always wear a badge, and that badge doesn't scan anywhere. It's just for identification. That type of idea. And then what is my own access? So if I'm a customer hosted in your environment, exactly what do I get? How do I get to my servers? What do I want to do? What if I want to see and feel and touch those servers? Network security. Network security is a big part of this. How is my data being transported across? You know, guaranteed you're going to come in some major pipe with everybody else. But once I'm inside, how is my data segregated internally? Well, we run virtual LAN. So each customer is going to get a segregated virtual LAN. So you're going to be isolated network traffic out to the edge point. Once you hit the internet, you're on the internet. Nothing we can do about it. Unless and we'll talk about network diagrams in a minute, unless you have some other alternatives. I have some diagrams. But the idea being, if you're using the straight internet to get to anywhere, you pretty much either presume SSL is there or encryption is there, and then behind the scenes, I'm segregated. One of the things we're finding now uh, with requests that we're getting, comparing, they always want comparisons of us and like Lotus Live Notes and all the other ones, is, well, how do you handle network stuff? You know, simple answer. In Lotus Live Notes, you're actually sharing that network connectivity. So you're actually go into the same server across the same network switch, across the same pipe behind the same firewall. Whereas in a hosted, dedicated environment that was asked about earlier, you're going to be guaranteed that you're on your own hardware, which has its own network. Now, you may share a switch somewhere, but the LAN's already been isolated and you're segregated that part. So the network traffic is segregated out. Don't be afraid to ask these questions. You want to know how that data is transported. If there's SSL involved and everything else, We'll talk about how the network works together in just a few minutes, but this is the security question. Next up on security, you should have a security section defined in your proposal or your request for information. You should actually have one in there that asks some very specific questions about how things are secured. You may not want anything but information. You may not have any requirements, but you want to know how it's done so when you go back and start making the big whiteboard of all the possibilities or making the chart or your project manager wants to compare, you have an area where you can compare security questions that you've already asked. Like I said, you may not have a requirement that you need something, but at least you have data that shows what's already offered and what's available and what's included for free. That's a big part of the puzzle. Now, verifying what they say, it requires an on-site visit. We welcome people to drop through, as most data centers do. 
Um, it'll be, you know, you can come in, you'll be escorted, you can see everything, you can touch, you can feel, you can see servers, it's great, it's fun. Uh, but the idea is that you see the physical facility and you actually understand what's going on. So you see the security from the physical standpoint as well as then you're able to sit down with the network team and talk architecturally of how, it, how it's laid out. Don't be afraid to do an on-site visit. It should be, unless you're just putting out a server that's not going to do a ton of confidential data or sit out there, someone needs to make the visit. You really do. We recommend it for all of them. We say please come in, have someone come by and visit. Um, I think it's often overlooked as an important step of a vendor relationship and also your comfort level with what goes on at your hosting providers and where you put your data. So don't be afraid to do that. Request as much internal documentation as you can about their policies. Some things can't be disclosed, of course. Certain procedures can't be disclosed. But there's some general things that we do disclose just due to simple questions, like I just brought up. Physical access, key card, biometrics, cameras. That's all standard stuff that we can provide. Um, we have controls in place for that documentation. You should request that of everybody. Don't be afraid to get more detailed if they give you a bland answer. Oh, yeah, well, we have, we have security. What security? Oh, we have some locked doors and stuff. Yeah, OK. I want some more information about that. Get a diagram. It should say design, sorry for the typo, for your proposed environment. Get a network design, I don't know how to pass spell check, for your environment itself. Uh, we will provide a network diagram that takes you from your servers out to the internet or through your private connection. So we'll give you a network diagram of that. So never be afraid to ask for that. Now there's a catch to this. If any company ever gives you an entire network document, beware. They're disclosing other people's security infrastructure as well. Whenever we give you a network diagram, it's only for your company, and it only shows your servers out to the Internet or out to your private link. We're not going to provide you with connectivity points across other servers and other customers. If they give you an entire diagram, be wary. That means they're giving your information to other people. So if you ever see that, be very concerned. Um, you should never see any mention, connectivity, or points of other customer servers anywhere across the board. So once I get into security and I'm getting into hosting, how does some of this work? So single sign-on is something I wanted to bring up. If I'm moving to a hosting environment, I presume they're naturally going to be an extension of my DNS, meaning I'm going to point my DNS names I need to at their IP addresses. So they have to have either public facing or if it's a private link, you know, internal IP addresses that match. But I want it to be part of a single sign-on environment. For every customer, we don't want them to be in, signing on to our domain. So we actually say, no, give us DNS names in your domain. We'll give you the IP addresses. Off you go. Now you have single sign-on running across the board. You, Windows gets into a whole different world. If you're talking about single sign-on using the Windows environment as well, well, then this server would have to be part of your Windows domain, and that gets into a mixed bag. That's Usually one or two people have made this work only because of private links that are better speeds. Everyone else, you're not going to have single sign-on that way. So it's pretty much I'm talking web interface only. Antivirus, big question on security. Uh, what do you run? Who runs it? Who manages it? Who updates it? What about the signature files? How often are they done? Everything you should ask. Uh, we will provide OS level, and if you ask for it, which we will be strongly against, we will provide domino level as well. But most of the time, you guys are catching all this at your gateways anyway, and you run local desktop solutions already in your environment. So running extra ones on domino servers, as many of you know, can be a big problem. Having some of that stuff running on the domino server can really cause conflicts a lot of times, and you'll see that documented everywhere. We run it at the gateway levels in terms of network access as well as in terms of mail access, so SMTP, you know, virus spam stuff. Is that included in my cost? That's one of the big things you want to know. You know we include it in a cost factor. Do other ones include in the cost? And should I rely on my desktop solution? And then SSL goes straight back to the same thing as single sign-on. Your SSL certificate should be portable, meaning you should use the same DNS and same DNS zone, so that way you can move your SSL certificates to the new provider without additional cost to you. All right, so keep that in mind. You want to really move that across. Now, what about encryption levels? Waited for your screen to update. Notes encryption. It's built in, fast, easy to deploy. It's in the product natively. You can turn it on with a simple switch and force all connections to a server to be notes encrypted. This allows you to go across the public internet without any concerns at all with Domino handling its own encryption layer. You don't have to worry about fobs or software or anything else. Now, VPN support. A lot of times we get this request, as a lot of providers do, they want VPN support. So instead of using native notes encryption, they want VPN support, which really doesn't make any sense. All you're doing is adding a layer of additional passwords and controls on top so you cannot have notes encryption turned on. 
because remember, a VPN is also there to compress traffic. Well, Notes has native compression and encryption, and if you use Notes to do both, it will actually compress the traffic and then wrap and encrypt it and send it to the server. So you get the benefit of both worlds. With VPN support, it's already encrypted and compressed as best it can, but because it's encrypted, Notes can't recompress that traffic, so you don't get any additional benefit out of it. You have to have another software device, things like that. Very few of our customers use VPN support. Most of them are using either encrypted direct traffic across the Internet, or they have private links. So it's a mixed bag. You can make the request, but a lot of them don't actually have that. What about the network itself? What do you guys do at that level? Um, am I sharing my switches? Am I sharing the cards? What about failover and load balance in the network? What about encryption? Well, port encryption, Domino takes care of that for you. You enable the comp compression and encryption, excuse me, on the same port in Domino, and you're set and good to go. Um, all the providers can give this for you in the Domino world. Keep this in mind, this doesn't affect things like connections. Uh, quicker for the web, you need SSL certificates for all of those. Any provider you move to for hosting, you should be getting an SSL certificate. It's going to be an additional cost. They're probably going to bill you one time uh, to actually just buy the certificate, or you could buy it yourself and have them implement it for free. So either way, you want to make sure that you have encryption somewhere laid on there. Because more than likely, you're sharing a network switch somewhere, but not maybe crossing traffic because of VLANs. But on some hosting providers, you're actually sharing the same network card on a physical hardware. So you actually have your data mixed and mingled in with other companies' data going across. If this is not a dedicated environment for you, and you're doing one of the shared environments, uh, Lotus Live Notes does it, Connections does it, Lotus Live Engage, so all those are shared environments, you're actually then putting your data in with others. How would you possibly segregate and isolate that data across a shared network card unless you're using some form of encryption? But keep in mind your users are using their certifiers to match the key, so it's actually Unless they're cross-certified with this third-party server that sits on the back end, you're really not getting a good port encryption across the board. Keep that in mind. You also want to see diagrams on network failover as well as load balancing to know how they provide not only their edges but internally in case of failures. You don't want to move your stuff out expecting these high SLAs to find out, oh, we lost one switch or one network card. We have nothing left. So you want to make sure you have a backup, you have production, you have uh, standbys for the network switches and everywhere else along the way. Once again, don't be afraid to ask for diagrams of how you're going to be connected to those servers and all the pieces that are involved inside so you can also see the single points of failure. So here's an example of internal external hybrid model, very simplified, but it doesn't go through the public internet, it uses a private link. We do this for a lot of customers. This is something you won't see at Lotus Live Notes currently in their diagrams, but you could do it probably with IBM. But the idea is that you drop and make the data center part of your network. So you're actually just dropping a part of your termination point inside of their data center, and it's seamless. It's behind the scenes. We do this for a lot. So we have a lot of WAN connectivities and frame drops where a customer says, you know what, I don't want to deal with tunnels and VPNs and everything else. I just want to make you part of my network so users never know the difference, and I don't know the difference, and it's all seamless, but you take care of everything for me. There you go. I give you a simple diagram for that. So the Internet's taken away unless people access things from the outside world, meaning outside of your network, because this is your network. So we have a lot of customers that do that. It's a great solution, a great way to go. Ask your provider if they give this service, and you'll be happy to know if they do. There'll be an additional cost for you guys, but it's still part of your network, so you're eating a network cost on that one. The option is to move it outside. So you have a firewall tunnel. So instead of building a private cost, you want to go a little bit more cost effective. You build a private VPN tunnel, firewall to firewall, so you actually have the connectivity secured and encrypted. Now, is notes encryption necessary at this point? Not necessarily. That means I'm leaving my environment, going across an encrypted firewall traffic tunnel to another firewall, and then into my servers. So what do I gain from notes encryption? Not a ton, because it's already being encrypted. Now, we do turn on server encryption if users will be coming straight from the Internet. So once again, it depends on where the users are coming from. Keep that in mind. A lot of these hosted environments, you guys are only sitting inside your environment, and you're never going to the outside. But on the other side, I want people to use Domino Web Access over SSL. I want them to use their Notes clients at home and not have to worry about a VPN connectivity. Well, then we'll have to turn on Notes encryption. But for your internal environment, you're coming straight across an encrypted tunnel already. It's a great secure way to do it. Lower cost, but higher chance of failure. 
So with that type of connectivity, usually it's one firewall to one firewall. You have a higher chance of failure somewhere with a glitch because then you have really no guarantee on how the Internet's going to behave. If it goes down, you've lost connectivity to those. So keep that in mind. That's a big piece. A lot of people ask us about that is how do you guarantee? We say we can guarantee up to that brick wall, and you can guarantee that brick wall as well as we actually want to manage the VPN device we connect to. But across the public Internet, you can't guarantee that. There's no way. So on their network side, you know, ask them about backup networks. Most large-scale data centers have them. They offload traffic from the primary, meaning when you are backing up my data, where do you send all that backup traffic? Is it across the same standard NIC card that I'm sharing already, or is it a backup? Most every large-scale one has a backup card, meaning our backup system runs across everything. So we have one global backup system. It connects to everything across a backup NIC and grabs the data that needs to grab. So it stays off of your primary traffic. It's dedicated solely for the backups. So you never see that traffic anywhere there. Make sure you ask about that. You don't want them using the same network cards, not only for shared customers, but also for backups. How will this fit inside my you know, domino name network or nodes name network, for those in the old school, the NNN? Uh, if you're having a hosted server somewhere, is it part of my nodes name network? Is it mail flowing instantly? Do I need more connection records? How is Domino seeing it as part of the server environment? This goes back to the old school of mail routing, because most of you are used to a very flat Domino name network nowadays, meaning everything's on the ports tab in your server document in the same network, TCP you know, network with the same name. You're not worrying about multiple networks anymore. But when you get into a hosting environment, you more than likely will build multiple networks. You'll build one over there and then build connection records to bring them together. And then native domino compression we talked about is the cheapest way to go to give you guys better performance and speed. Make sure they can support that and turn that on for you. So what about the hardware? There's a great question we had earlier about the hardware and colo. Dedicated. If you're running dedicated, you're the only customer using everything about it. RAM, disk, memory, whatever you want to know. You're the one using network connectivity cards. You're the customer that's using it. In a shared environment, you're sharing everything, including the disk and the physical hardware, so you're relying on the load of the other ones. That's what makes hosting in a shared environment very, very strange and very hard to manage unless you give everybody identical layouts, meaning no one gets a variance at all because someone could eat up more resources. Lotus Live Notes follows this model. They follow it directly by saying everyone will get mail, everyone will get this much space, everyone will get this much allocate. It's exactly the same. Everyone has this template. You know, we don't allow custom templates. With dedicated, put custom templates, connect it to your VOIP, have a you know unified inbox, whatever you want to do. But shared, you can't do that because you need to make sure everyone has the same allocation. With dedicated, you could tweak who can run the agents out of office. With shared, you're not going to do that. Everyone's going to get the same thing. Uh, virtualized. One of the cheapest and simplest ones you can do nowadays. A lot of people are doing that. Uh, keep in mind, that means they're sharing disk and they're sharing RAM and they're still sharing processor. It's just virtualized. So you're still sharing the same stuff, but virtualized and assigning pieces of it to you. But it's usually piecing across multiple pieces of hardware, so you're still sharing the same hardware virtualizing it. You're not getting a dedicated, you know, this piece of memory. Well, it's only, you know, two gig sticks or one gig stick in there. Well, and we're each getting 512. Well, guess what? You're splitting one stick between two people. A lot of them don't get that and they want to go virtualized. The big part is disk. In a virtualized environment, you're sharing disk. So striping, how it's on the SAN, if it is on the SAN or a NAS, or you know, it's never usually local for any reason at all, you're going to be sharing that stuff. And you need to be aware of that and you need to know how their SAN is set up and how failover and redundancy is established as well as backups, mainly when you're sharing all that stuff. Um, we tend to go dedicated. For almost everything we have, we go dedicated. That way you know that your environment is your environment and Everything you want to do with it, you can do. If you want to add more, more disk on the fly, no problem. If your server has space, we can add more in. If you need bigger drives, we can add it in. If you need to connect to a SAN, well, you can. But that's an option. But with things like RAM and disk and memory, it can all be done on the fly. It may have an outage for restart for memory and things, but you don't have to worry about other people and how, people and how to allocate it across the customers. So we talked a little about the clients. Real quick to reinforce them, you have choices from the notes encryption, the VPN, and don't be confused when they say S-MIME because it's for mail only. Um, don't, I've had customers say, well, we want S-MIME on all our mail. Okay, so you want to be able to have secure message sending and receiving, so you want TLS stuff out on the uh, SMTP servers. They go, no, no, we want S-MIME in our mail. 
make sure the terms are well understood from the provider as well as when you guys ask the right questions. Uh, also, the support they'll give if you decide to go down the VPN route is who's going to support the VPN. So if they're going to give all your users VPN connectivities, who's going to support it, who's going to do the help desk calls, because if it's their hosting center, more than likely you won't see it or manage it. It'll be up to them. So keep that in mind and get that well defined in your SLAs as well as in the document of who's going to do support for you. Backups. One of my favorite things is backups because everyone wants to know how do you do them. Uh, fulls versus incrementals, you guys get the idea down the list. Archiving and journaling, one of the things you have to worry about with mainly in the domino environments is a lot of your companies want to archive. Where do you archive? We allow you on dedicated servers to archive all you want. It's your server. Do what you want to do. On many of them, you don't have that capability. You have a 25 gig limit. Where am I going to archive? You know, I've only got one allocated space for that mail file. I don't have room for the other ones. So I have to archive locally or I have to set up an archive server on premises or something like that. Keep that in mind when you ask that question. Uh, journaling is the same. In my journaling mail over there, I'm able to see it. Now once I get all that in place, where does everything sit? Does it sit on the sand? How does that get striped? How does it get allocated? How many LUNs? Am I going across multiple? Who's sharing it with me? Who, you know, there's spindle speeds, everything else. You want that information from them. If you are running dedicated hardware and connect, then you're going to get dedicated space usually on the sand that's going to be allocated to you. So you get all that in play is how do you back it up? Well, the fun part is, is actually running full versus incremental. You have Deos now. You have incremental backups. You have transaction logging. So you want to get all that well defined and then worry about a retention policy. So first worry about how they're backing it up. Are they going to do a full every single night across all your systems? If so, great. Then all I have to worry about is storage. How long are you going to keep it for me in retention? If you're doing fulls once a week and then doing incrementals, how far back are those going? How do I get access? How long does it take to restore? How do you guarantee the backups? How do you test the backups? Things like that. A lot of companies don't do enough retrievals and test restores uh, when they're doing incremental backups. Transaction logging and incrementals is dependent on each backup carrier. It's not as easy as you think it is, so keep that in mind. So we talk about retention a lot. Um, everyone has a standard retention policy and restoration policy. What you're going to find is, for example, ours right now is about 16 to 17 days standard. That's what you're going to get and able to retrieve data back. But we do our full monthlies and we do longer uh, for retention off-site, but you can request and specify anything specifically you want. In a shared environment, that's a lot tougher because usually they do the whole server as one whole thing. Keep that in mind. Also in dedicated, you can split how you want your servers laid out in terms of clustering. In shared environments, you're pretty much established what they have in their architecture unless you have a special agreement. So your retention on your backups is very important. A lot of you have requirements. SEC requirements, HIPAA requirements, and others that you want to know, when can I get to this data, how long does it take to restore, and how far back do you keep it? So we have some customers we burn off a monthly and keep it for years. And it's kept off-site in storage, and we can retrieve it within four hours. It's a great feature to have, but it's an additional cost because you're eating the cost of a tape. So keep that in mind when you talk about backup costs. Even though you outsource a lot of things, you may have had a policy in place that you kept backups for a year. Well, well, you need to make sure you add that into your cost when you go out. You don't want a surprise later when you find out they only kept your backup for three weeks. Um, you also want to know who has access to the backup files themselves. You'd like to know, you know, who can retrieve the tape, who has access to the data on the tape, is the tape data encrypted and stored, as well as where it's transported to and kept. You know, we're, we're pretty open about it. You know, we go through Iron Mountains, we send it off site. It's kept as a secure facility. It's brought back when we need to. It's in a lockbox. The transport carrier never is able to open the lockbox. We have the key on the receiving end. So it's a very secure procedure. Data is encrypted on the tapes, things like that. Make sure you get all that documented and listed so you don't have this type of failure that you see now. Right? You don't want to lose any of your data, and you hate users that call you because they deleted a message the day before. So a couple things on topology to finish this up. Load balancing. This can be in-house or through the provider. You're taking your current server and duplicating the data. Right? It's replication, as you guys know it, but you're using both servers. That's load balancing. You're using both servers. Internally, you may have a cluster, or you may give us a server that runs as a cluster mate with one you have internally, and users bounce back and forth because you've already done your bandwidth studies we talked about to start off. It's a big part of it. So we have, for example, a school district. Uh, we are more of, their, more of their hot side in a way, but we found that because they had tons of bandwidth, 
they were able to use us as a fully redundant cluster provider because they were running off of local replicas, which we're now moving to manage replicas. So they'll have even faster access locally that's better managed. The users never know the difference. They don't know what server they're on, where they're replicating to. It doesn't matter. It's a seamless cluster. But they had the bandwidth to spare. So make sure that that's done. We also run comparison reports across clusters. Uh, usually once a month or so, we'll run a comparison report to make sure that the data between the two cluster mates is in sync. You'll find a lot of times that something gets missed or the counts are way off. We're not talking unread marks. We're talking about the number of documents as well as are the databases even there. So are the cluster mates there and are the document counts correct? Keep that in mind when you do it. We're going to look at some more topology diagrams in a second. A hybrid combines your internal management and external management or your internal hardware and you just want to put a server somewhere else. It could be a DR scenario, but that's a hybrid hosting environment. You're actually just moving a server somewhere to the outside. Don't be afraid to tweak and build an environment to fit your needs and call it what you want. It doesn't matter to us. We could be your full cluster mate. We could be your DR site. We could be um, a hybrid build. We could be just redundancy. We could be your primary. It's a server. It's hosted. It's managed the same. How much control you want to dominate is up to you, but we monitor it, we manage it, we back it up, we provide it's the same in that environment. Some providers are going to be very piecemealed about what you can do, how you interface, how you interact. Be ready to ask the questions. Now internally, a lot of you have this now. You have all the components you need under your management and your control. It's an internal disaster recovery. It could be down the hall, it could be in the same data center room, it could be up the street at one of your other office facilities, but it's under your control. Right. That's easy to move and manipulate and use a hybrid or fully hosted environment to provide geographic. If you, let's say you only have offices on the East Coast and only in two places in the city. You have two places in San Francisco. Well, you want a server somewhere else, right? That's an idea too. So geographic location can be part of it as well as providing you guys redundancy. So domino clustering. You have two internal systems. You have a private frame. It's you both your firewalls. This is you splitting across two data centers, right? I made these as simple as I could. So you're able to take all your application, all your mail, cluster it to cluster mates to sit somewhere else inside your environment. You're behind both your parts of the firewall on your network. Where's your failure point? Well, right now, if that private link goes down, or you lose power at the data center on the right. Now, this is a good catch. A lot of them don't understand. If I lose power at my internal system, I also then lose that frame link more than likely. So I have no connectivity to my hotspot. So I, the failover is just there. People have to go outside the firewall or to a different facility to get access to the data that sits in our facility. That's one big thing. Now, if these were in one facility, of course, you could be totally out. But a lot of them overlook the fact that, yeah, we've got a full cluster environment built up the street geographically. And if we lose power, we're fine. If you lose power, you've also lost your connectivity because you're going to lose all your switches and everything else. You won't be able to get to that site unless you physically go there. So keep that in mind when you design the diagrams. Then we also have some that will actually do domino clustering behind, but use a firewall tunnel across the public internet to provide public internet access. So any of your users could go immediately up the street to a Panera's or a coffee shop and access through the secondary firewall into the cluster. But on the back end, we're actually moving all the cluster data. Users never really go across that back end. It's a behind the scenes backup cluster network. So if the data is a little bit out of sync because of power failure, we don't care. The users are able to access outside the firewalls as they need to. It's another way to look at your topology design. Keep in mind, either one of these sides could be an external hosting provider very easily. So what is extranet support? Extranet support is taking a piece of the infrastructure and letting them expose it to the Internet. So it could be yourselves doing it at another site, but more than likely it's a provider that you guys don't want to expose your network or build a DMZ layer. So you replicate or send data or build a system at a provider, and then they show that to the Internet. So they're the Internet facing that there is. Uh, that's the most common thing that we have for a lot of customers with same time, is they want us to be their Internet facing. So what you'll get is an internal set through your firewall to an external set, then the provider then sees the Internet. Uh, like I said, same time is probably the biggest one we get for this then we get into things like, you know, Domino web servers and things like that. We have some customers you know that their Domino environment sits securely behind their firewalls, but all their web presence isn't really at their data centers. It's actually sitting with us. So they didn't want to have web exposure on theirs, so they connected up to a provider to take care of that. 
it's a good way to secure and keep your own environment behind your own firewall and an easy way to manage that. So we talked about this at the very beginning, the full outsource design. It's a full implementation of hosted services, redundancy and failovers built in. Um, you can build any continuity you want inside of it. You can build any failover and redundancy on the hosted side, whatever you want to do, but it's all based on your bandwidth and you actually being able to pull it off. So you need to be able to connect to them. You need to be able to understand the architecture decision. You need to be able to understand my outgoing bandwidth versus also what they're going to be allowing in terms of bandwidth limits and caps. But this is a full implementation of my mail, my applications, my same time, whatever I want, and a hosting provider and getting me out of the business of running my IT. So that's pretty much the simplest diagram that you'll ever see. And this is what a lot of people think the cloud is. But really it isn't. It's a hybrid model for almost everybody we deal with for the cloud. So we're right on time. We're ending right at the minute we need to. If you guys have more questions, I'd be glad to take those. Let me see if there's anything in the queue. I've been peeking. But we're right on time and ending in an hour, like I promised. So we have a few minutes for Q&A if anyone needs it. If not, this will be very simple. All these slides will be available for you to download as well, as always. Uh, you'll be able to replay this as well. So if there's anyone in your environment that needed to see this or management or anything else that you start talking about it, if you have direct questions about any of the slides, you can actually get in there and see the slides themselves um, and then send those on. You can refer to a certain slide if you want to. If you have a question about architecture diagrams, you can find me online at all these places. Oh, and keep in mind uh, as well, I do Sphere is 15th and 16th of February. Uh, the Consult in Your Pocket stuff is all the replays are up and available for you to stream whenever you want to. And there's tons of them out there now uh, for everyone to replay. And thanks for everyone that's been going back and visiting. It's been amazing, the amount of traffic. And if you guys need to connect to me, uh, email is a good way. Also, I publish everything through Facebook. For those of you on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash I do notes network. All together, one word. So everything I do publishes through there. If you guys have more questions, uh, I only see a couple of small things which I answered in there already. Uh, nothing new is coming in. You guys are welcome for those that are saying thanks. Otherwise, I will talk to you all guys. If everyone's at Lotusphere, please track me down and see me. I have four sessions at Lotusphere, so I'll be easy to find. Track me down there. Otherwise, it's another Consultant in Your Pocket webcast. And everyone, I'll give you back about 10 minutes. Have a great, uh, hopefully not snowy like we're having, afternoon.